Okay, again, very quick announcement uh, for you. Uh, just for the office hour, just to make it convenient for both you and me. Uh, I think uh, 12.30 to 2.30 on Tuesday will be the new one. So this will be no office hour on Monday afternoon anymore for the rest of the term. Okay? But if you want to see me uh, at a different time, let me know. But for now, for the rest of the term, 12.30 to 2.30 on Tuesday. And the office hours on Wednesday remain the same. And let me remind you for lab number four, which is about Sing Odyssey. I'm not too sure how many of you have started. At least I haven't received any questions from you. But you better start. The due date is actually next Friday, 3 p.m. Not this Friday, but about less than two weeks. But it was, it was released during the reading week. Okay? And for your lab number four and also for your projects, again, it's highly recommended you try to set up the uh, regression testing using the approach I introduced to you in the video. Uh, if you haven't set it up for lab three, I will urge you to start right away. If you got trouble, let me know. It's worth doing. Okay? It's a very good uh, self-engineering practice for you to uh, get adopted. Okay. okay, let's talk about the issue for today. I promised I'm going to talk about this particular design. Remember last Wednesday I talked about, before I introduced inheritance in how you can do it in iPhone, I talked about two design attempts and try to illustrate why they are not so satisfactory because of single choice principle, cohesion, and, and etc. One of you who, is not, who does not seem to be here right now. Anyway, he proposed something like this. Why don't we have a quick look? I call that attempt 2.5 because it's pretty much like a, a slight, very, quite a clever extension to attempt number two. Let's talk about it and see why it may not be a very good design. Let's take a look. So we still have our student class over here. And then we still have courses. We also have got kind. Right? We talk about this a particular attribute to encode uh, the kind of students. And let's say one is for resident students, and two is for non-resident students, let's say. And what's really interesting here is we declare more global attributes over here to be accessible by, by all the features in the same class. So here we simply say we got rates just for premium rates or uh, a discount rate or other rates, depending on which one we are talking about. And also we got tuition here, also we got max over here. The size of the list, I just use linked list, just make it easier and more efficient to for insertion and deletion in the, from the middle, okay? So rates, tuition, and max, the size of the list corresponds to how many kinds of students you have at the moment, okay? I'll write it down here. That's the essence for this particular implementation. Okay, the size, of all the lists, they should be of the same size, correspond to how many kinds of students you have. Corresponds to the number of kinds. Okay, so now currently, since we got two kinds, we're gonna get only two values in each of the array. And let's see how that works. The only place you have to initialize these, let's say to begin with, is in the constructor. Let's say the make over here. Okay, and then uh, I'll maybe, uh, let me write it down here. Let's say if I have a particular kind of student, let's say the student, uh, I'll just say students here, okay, that's an object. Let's say this student is meant to be a non-resident student, NRS is meant to be, okay, that's an object. And as we know, the kind should be two. Okay, I'll put it here. Kind over here should be the value two, that's encoding. And then it's going to store the rate, tuition, and also max, okay? The way we set it up is by using this notation here. Okay, I'll write it down quickly for you to understand. So here I got rate, I got maximum, I also got tuition. Okay. Let me just try to see if I can move a little bit uh, in a different place. Okay, how about here? Slightly better. Okay, so we got the three arrays over here. Let's say for the rates, let me write it down. For the rates, it's going to be an array of size two. In that case, it's going to be 1.25 and 0 0.75. 1.25, 0 0.75, okay? And then, this is index one, this is index two. Notice that the index two over here corresponds to the kind. So that means for this kind of students, the only value for the rate that's applicable is 0 0.75. Follow up? Okay, why would this be useful? Let me show you right away. Now, if we want to calculate the tuition, right, get tuition, 
the way we implement that, I'm going to make it available to you so you can look a little more closer. Okay? So now, the way we do it, we still got the across loop, and then we'll say tuition at index kind, which means I want to update this particular student I'm talking about for the runtime instance. And then you simply go through the loop, and then simply calculate the base amount. And then, the way to know what kind of rate to apply, in this case, because the rate for this particular kind of student, in this case, kind is index two. So that would be 0 0.75, which means, which means for non-resident students, I want to apply discount rate. That's how that works. Guys, any questions up to now? So the make is where you initialize all the uh, attributes over here. So what I want you to do is to compare this 2.5 attempt as opposed to attempt number two. The way we did it is by, you can see the one I highlighted in green over here. So these attributes over here, the rates, the tuition, and the max, in the design number two, they used to be local variables, but now I promote it into global variables. That's number one. Number two, I'm assuming that whatever kind I'm, have, I'm having for this particular instance, I'm going to use it to get access to the corresponding rate, or maximum, or tuition, etc. Right? You will see the code over there. Okay? Jordan, question. So that is to say, if you want to calculate, oh, just to make this work for this particular one. So if I want to, let's say, get tuition for the current students, what I would say is go to tuition and go to this kind of students and then try to get access to it. Yeah, just like a starting point, basically. Yeah, but just as like a sketch still, right? Okay, guys, so now, uh, I think that's enough detail for you to judge whether it's a good design or bad design. Again, the way to judge, you can talk about cohesion, you can talk about single choice principle. You can talk about when you got a collection of students. Let me only talk about two of them. Okay, only two. What about cohesion? Based on what I have drawn already, let me just make it a little bit bigger for you. If you look at the diagram I have over here, do you think cohesion is satisfied in this case based on the drawing over here? That's my question. If I'm talking about, let's say, non-resident student, that's why chi is equal to 2. Am I storing any information that's unnecessary for non-resident students in this case? Am I or am I not? Anybody? Justin? Yeah. Yes? Exactly the rate over here, right? You can see, as far as cohesion is concerned, you can see this particular value over here. This is not applicable for resident students. Oh, sorry, for non-resident students. Sorry about that. For non-resident students, in this case, it's encoding two. And similarly, if you got resident students, you also got the other value that's not applicable. So you're storing something that's not so relevant. So that's violating cohesion. So cohesion is a cross. Okay? Cohesion is actually cross over here. Okay? And now, single choice principle, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. But I can see something that's much more severe in this particular design. Let me give you a little bit of hints. Whenever you think about judging the design, think about adding something to your design or removing something from your design. Let me talk about removal, just get straight to the point. Currently, I have two students, two kinds of students, either resident or non-resident students. What if I decide I'm going to get rid of the kind of resident students. What should I change in the objects? Which means the kind number one should not be applicable anymore, right? If I want to remove this kind of uh, students. What's going to happen here? Well, let's identify which part I should change, right? Would you agree if I decide Let's say this kind over here for kind number one, resident student, is going to become obsolete. So that means I should somehow remove it, right? And as far as I have drawn so far, I should really remove this particular slot. There's two ways you can deal with this, okay? I'll show you two approaches. They're equally bad. Let's say if I do approach one, if I simply get rid of it, I get rid of it just because the resident students becomes obsolete. 
and I'm not sure if you notice in the linked list, if you actually remove this guy here, everything will be shifted to the left by one position. So that means now the index over here is, is not going to become one. As you can see, this particular design depends heavily on the, using the indices to correspond to the kind of students. But as soon as you try to delete, you're going to mess up already with the indices. But now you just got one. But what does one really mean? Jordan. So that causes further problems, because in all the other classes where you create it. Exactly. You're going to yeah. grow the array. I'm just saying that's exactly the problem. Yeah. Okay? You might argue as follows. You might argue to say, rather than removing this particular slot, why don't I simply keep this slot here? I'll keep it. So I can still keep number two over here, let's say. Second solution. But instead of removing it, I'm going to assign that to maybe minus one. However, the drawback for that is at the runtime later, you may have an array that looks like this. Maybe you have minus one, minus one, maybe 1 1.25, and minus one, and etc. It's still very poor because now you're creating so, so many empty slots in, in the array that's not being useful at all. Okay, so this is a quick response to one of you guys. Okay, uh, again, the person is not here today, but anyway, hopefully he'll watch the recording later. Okay, again, we talk about actually three designs before we introduce you to the inheritance, which is my, uh, maybe the best you can do for this particular problem for student management system. But you should also know why the other designs are not appropriate, judging by the relevant design principles. Before I move on to inheritance, any questions? You can see the process is very logical. You try to apply every design principle that we talk about so far. And every time you apply the principle, think about what kind of changes you can make to your design. And then you get your answer. Yes? Yeah, I would say if you decided to argue it's going to be bad for single choice principle, what you're going to argue is if I make a change, I'm going to change in multiple places. Okay? Think about it as an exercise. Okay, I presume everybody's okay. And then, of course, in later when you do your, your Sync Odyssey game for Lab 4 and Lab, uh, and also the projects, you want to somehow justify for your design decision. Maybe you will encounter things like this. So the best solution is to use inheritance, maybe, for this kind of problem. Okay, okay so what I will do now, I'm going to just review very quickly uh, the inheritance structure, very quickly. And then we're gonna go into some important exercise. Okay, my plan is, I hope, by today and also Wednesday, I want to finish reviewing all the topics related to inheritance, just as a brush up from 2030. And then, starting from next Monday, we can do design, more design patterns. Okay, so for inheritance design, we got three classes. We got students. So this is the class where we put all the common code to be inherited to the child classes, right? We got name and we got courses. And also we got the register command, over here, that's also going to be inherited verbatim, okay? And also we got tuition here, that's also going to be inherited to the subclasses. Now, in every subclass, okay, just in general, let me just sketch for you, okay? Because it's very important to understand the, the uh, about polymorphism and dynamic binding later. Just in general, if I have a class called A over here, it could be deferred or it could be effective, either one, okay? Let me just say A, just in general. If I define f, feature f over here, okay? f can be anything. It can be also a set of features. If I decide to have inheritance, let's say I have a class b over here. So what are the possible things I can do in a subclass? Okay, so these are the number of things you can do. Number one, you can introduce new feature. I'll say nf. So new feature does not exist in any of the parents or parents' parents or parents' parents right, et cetera, new feature. Or you might decide to actually redefine whatever f is, right? In this case, I'll say f over here, and then I'll say plus plus. Plus plus means redefine. Okay? That's all I want to say for now, just as far as coding is concerned. For every subclass, you can choose to inherit verbatim, or you can simply redefine, or introduce something that's completely new, okay? Having this in mind, very quickly, okay? There will be some design decisions you have to make. Let's say we have class A, we have also class B. If I have an object over here, OBJ, and then 
I have either design choice number one versus design choice number two, right? In choice number one, I can declare objects to be of type A. In choice number two, I can declare object of type B. Okay, just a very general design decision you have to make. Question for you, why would you choose one but not the other? That's my question. Justin. Indeed. So what Justin said was exactly right. If you chose design number one, if you chose design number one here, and that's something we also try to give you more intuition in just a moment. If you chose design number one, so that means if you try to say objects dot f, this will compile. If you say objects dot nf, this would not compile. Because as far as the compiler is concerned, you declare a, all you can expect to do on objects depends on its static type over here. Okay, I'll review this a little bit more sy uh, systematically in just a moment. So in that case, if you believe all you need will be just F, in that case, you're fine. Okay, you just choose design choice number one. On the other hand, for design choice number two, so that means you're expecting to have objects.f and also objects.nf. Okay, in this case, you will rather, in that case, both will compile. So this will be just another design choice. Having just uh, a single value over here, like either, op, uh, either A or B, it's not so interesting. Let me just give you a little bit more context, and then we're going to review that later. Design choice number one up here, and also design choice number two. Rather than a single object, I'm going to put an array. I can either say A is of type array or linked list, doesn't matter, just a collection of A versus A of type array. And then I'll say B. I think the blue ones I just presented is gonna be most relevant to the design patterns we're gonna talk about later, okay? Now, the similar principle apply, as Justin just uh, said, said to us. So now I'll just mention very quickly. If you uh, have design choice number one, so that means A at some position I, I assuming that I is valid. So now in this case, if I say A, I at position, uh, sorry, F, if I call uh, feature F, that would be okay. On the other hand, if I say A, I dot new F, so that would not be okay, because statically it's only A, which does not support an F, which is only in B, okay? Similarly, for over here, if you got A, I over here dot F, that's fine. If you say A, I dot N, F, that's also fine. It's a very quick sketch. Yes. Given that you got A being the superclass and B being the subclass, if you are over here trying to call a feature that's already defined the superclass, it will compile. That, that's what I meant by okay. On the other hand, if you're trying to call a feature that's only introduced in the subclass, Whereas the static type is actually the parent type, so that would not be okay, which means you wouldn't compile. Correct, the NF is declared in the sub subclass. Mm -hmm. So the reason that this is not okay was because object was declared to be type A. A does not have NF, as easy as that, okay? And over here, this is okay because object was declared as B, and B does have NF, so that's why calling NF is fine, okay? So it's a very a little bit abstract example, but hopefully that rings the bell from 2030, right? But I'm gonna review that in different context, okay? Let me just go back to my code over here. And now, one more thing I want to say, just about the inheritance. Of course, in the code over here, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bother you too much with the coding itself. It's quite similar to how you will write it in uh, Java, very similar. Just a few points I want to highlight synthetically. Whenever you want to overwrite a particular method, that's a Java term. In Ivan, we say redefine. Okay? You want to explicitly say, I want to redefine this particular tuition that's inherited from the student class. You got to say that explicitly. Otherwise, you'll get a compilation error, number one. 
Number two, if, let's say, in this particular tuition class, this is the more common case. I inherit the body of my parent version of some feature. I want to use it and then add something to it additionally. The way to do it is by saying something like this. You can see here we say base is assigned to precursor. Precursor is, is like a super keyword in Java, just like that. Okay? So over here you're saying, when I say precursor here, you're saying call the version of the current feature, which is tuition. Tuition from the parent class, which is students. Okay, nothing new. You learned it already in uh, the Java course. Okay, I'm calling this version here. You can think about this guy here is a precursor that I'm referring to. Okay, uh, one more syntax uh, you may want to pay attention to. Okay, I'll write it down uh, in a different page. Okay, you might find it useful. What if the feature you inherit from the parent class has some parameter? How would you do it? Okay, quickly. Let's say, again, this is my student class. And then, remember, there was a uh, command called register, which does take one parameter. And then, let's say I have my subclass over here. Let's say I want to redefine it. So now it makes the resident students, for example. Okay. And now, for the register, I can choose to redefine that over here. I can say plus plus. By the way, for, for you to draw a bound diagram, it should indicate whether it should be redefined or just to effect the feature. So now, for this register here, uh, also it's going to be the same signature, the same header. Okay, let me go a little bit detail here. How do I say I want to call the version that's in the blue from the parents and then do something else? Right? The way to do it is precursor. Because this is simply just a command, right? It's a command, doesn't return anything. So I can simply say precursor, and then whatever parameter I have, I can say C. You don't have to say precursor dot register. Maybe in some language you have to, but not in iPhone. Okay, just to remind you. And then after this, you can put something extra for this particular subclass. Okay, so this is just for your information. If you want to do uh, inheritance in your maybe lab number four and the projects. Okay, any question about the uh, structure, Jordan? Can you do precursor dot? Like, because what if you wanted to call a different method that was from the superclass? If you want to call a different, I tried that briefly this morning. It seems like you cannot. If you want to use precursor, you have to talk about this particular feature, its parent version. Yeah, you have to. I'll try a little bit deeper, and then if that's possible, I'll let you know. Okay. Yes? The parent class. So precursor tell you the immediate parents. You cannot say, I want to call the precursor of my parents' parents. You cannot do it. Like in Java, right? You cannot arbitrarily jump levels. It has to be immediately above level. Yep. Exactly. So basically, when you say precursor C over here, what you're saying is, as a first step for this redefined version, I'm going to execute whatever that's defined as a body for the register in the parent class. Do that first, and then I'll do something else. It's like a reusing the code from your parents. Okay? So you can see inheritance from the code reuse point of view is very good. You can really try to minimize code duplicates, if not to get rid of them at all. Okay. So that's point number one. Point number two, given that we know that for every subclass, we can introduce new features. So that makes the expectation for each child class seems to be more than the expectation on their parent class. That's a very critical insight into inheritance. We're going to talk, we're going to review that in a more uh, explicit context. Uh, bear with me. Okay. Okay, I assume everybody is okay for inheritance programmatically. Okay, we're going to see more inheritance coding example later. We're going to talk about um, you know, the uh, design patterns. So let me just move on. Okay, let's see a little bit of slides. Okay, so the slides themselves are pretty self-contained, so I may have to uh, speed up a little bit when we talk, uh, maybe focus more on the iPad example. But I'll make sure I don't skip, uh, I don't skip any important points. So that's the inheritance hierarchy we have. And then, uh, when we talk about code reuse, so this slide here basically just talk about what you can do 
in each subclass, right? You can add new attributes, add new features. You can also try to redefine features, okay? Nothing has been uh, missed, okay? You can just review this slide more carefully. So this is only specific to the student management system. The one I talk about on the iPad is more general, okay? It applies. And this is just some simple test case for you to test the, uh, test the two students' classes. Okay, I'll leave that to you. That's also very easy to write. We're gonna see more interesting test case in just a moment, okay? Like how you can calculate tuition and et cetera. Okay, we're, talk, we're, talk, uh, we're gonna talk very quickly about static type versus dynamic type, very quickly. Okay, static type versus dynamic type, just syntax quickly. I briefly mentioned this maybe in the very beginning of the semester since that was necessary for you to complete the lab. But let's uh, just review, okay. So now, in Java, okay, also in the C uh, family, like a C shop or other, many other languages. When you declare a type over here, this type here is called static. Which means once you declare the type over there, it doesn't change. No way to change it, okay. And these are the variables, and after the new keyword, the types you put over here after the new, they are called dynamic type. Dynamic in the sense that you may want to change them as often as you like. And sometimes you do have to change them as you go in your developments. Okay, static versus dynamic. I'm pretty sure you learned about it uh, in 2030. Okay, but I'm gonna review. They should be, it should be no surprise you support similar concept in any programming language that supports OO, like in iPhone. Okay, let's see the syntax, how it looks like. In iPhone, when you declare your variable, let's say S and RS, you declare S to be of type students and also students over here. So these are static, when you declare them. The static here corresponding to the static here. Just try to read, uh, declare them. It's very important to remember what a compiler cares about is what you declare the variables to be. So whenever I ask you, uh, there will be two typical questions that will ask you, either in the lecture or in the exam. Typical, I'll just tell you very quickly, okay? In the context of inheritance, right? When we talk about inheritance, a very typical, typical two questions I might ask is number one, does the code compile? Number one, okay? Number two, if it compiles, how does it behave? For example, when I say how does it behave, it could be maybe a version of feature being called. If you got multiple subclasses, you got multiple version you can choose from at the runtime, right? Which version should it be called, okay? And also, will there be any cast exception? Okay, things like that. So these are the two typical questions, right? Either one or two. Whenever you want to answer about question number one, all you need to consider would be static type. Never ever worry about dynamic type when you try to answer question one. For question one here, you only consider static type. For question number two, you will typically only consider dynamic, but maybe sometimes you have to consider static a little bit. I'll say a mix, okay? Both static and dynamic. Dynamic, but it's in mainly just dynamic type, okay? Let's get this very clear. I think you're gonna see me asking you a lot of questions uh, as we go through, not just the inheritance lecture, but also later for the uh, um, design patterns. When we talk about design decision, you have to know about the distinction between these two questions. All your compiler can do, either Java compiler, iPhone compiler, c -sharp compiler, all they can do is they can answer a question like oh, number one. They can never ever answer any question regarding number two in a general way. I'll get to there a little bit later, okay? Okay, and then, so now how do you write dynamic type in iPhone, okay? Whenever you got a create keyword over here, what follows that over here, you can see I can put in curly brackets, right, over here, students or resident students, right? So these are dynamic type.
Okay? And there is some shortcut you can actually put. Okay? I'll show it to you. Let's say over here, if I declare S to be of type students, okay? now that's only static type I declare. If I want to write to creates, let's say creates, dynamically I also want the S to be a student. Let's say I don't want it to be a particular kind. I can also put students over here. That's a dynamic type. And then I can say S the make, and then some name over here. So now in this kind of special case where the static type is the same as the dynamic type, in that case, you can simply omit this particular file, this particular fragment. You can just omit it, and that would be how it looks like. It's a synthetic sugar for iPhone, okay? just in case. But it cannot go wrong if you always put the brackets to specify exactly what the dynamic type should be. That's fine too. Okay. Any question about the syntax here, static versus dynamic? Everybody's okay? All right, good. So now, what I would like to do, uh, for those of you who still got a copy of the exercise I gave to you from last time, would you pull it out? Okay. If not, you can simply go to a uh, lecture site. Uh, I also made a PDF available there. Go to the second page. Okay. There's something I want to uh, review or to introduce to you to, if you didn't know that. Okay. In your particular projects, you may have more than one inheritance hierarchy. Right? But for every inheritance hierarchy you have, you should know a certain thing about expectation. Okay? That, that's the way I put it. I think that's the most intuitive way for you to get to judge whether I should declare one type but not the other. Okay, let, me be, uh, let me talk about how you can interpret this exercise over here. For our student management system classes, remember we got a super class called students. We got resident students, we got non-resident students. Right? In the student class, we got name, we got courses, we got register, we got tuition. So these are the four features we declare at the student class level, the parent class. On the other hand, for each of the subclasses, we try to do what I said you could do, right? For example, in the resident students class, I try to declare a new feature called premium rates, which doesn't exist in the parent class. And also, I have another new command called set premium rates. Similarly, for the non-resident students class, I got a new feature discount rate and set discount rate. You can see these two new features versus these two new features are disjoint. Right? They have nothing to do with each other. So which in siblings in the inheritance hierarchy, they are not related in some way. They only just have a common ancestor or parents. Okay, that's one thing to note. And you can see that Tuition somehow is inherited to over here in the resident students and also in the non-resident student. We simply try to redefine them using either premium rates or discount rate. Right? That's kind of the setup. Okay. Any question about this to begin with? So this inheritance hierarchy, we're going to refer to it quite often, quite often. So uh, I think uh, if you've got any questions, it's now time to ask. OK, yes. Of course, the plus sign means something that's deferred in the parent class, you want to now effect it. If you got plus plus, that means you got something that's already implemented in the parent class, now you want to redefine it. So notice the difference between plus versus plus plus. You can see from the diagram slides. And should you include those, uh, those uh, notations in your bound diagram? Of course, absolutely. Right. I would say, yeah, typically it's to the right, typically, yeah. Mm, I would say for now, it's a good question. The question was, is student here more like an interface, more like an abstract class? I would say treat it just like a class. So I'm saying in this particular class, say everything's implemented. Let's not get things more complicated. We'll get to things more like an interface and things more like an abstract class when we talk about design patterns. But here, I'm just talking about in general. Think about we just have an inheritance hierarchy here. In the parent class, somehow you just, you just happen to have all the features implemented, let's say. Good. All right, so now here's the exercise, okay? I want you to, I'll look at that together with you. We have several decorations, we also have several uh, creations, okay? Let me go over that with you. For S1, S2, S3, their static type is simply students. For RS, the static type is resident students. For NRS, it's non-resident students. 
okay, static types. And then in the next few lines, I'm trying to basically to say dynamically at the runtime, what object should be attached, what should be linked to this particular reference. For example, here I say for S1, which was declared to be a student, I want to say dynamically it should be a student. There is certain rule to judge whether this particular dynamic type specification is valid or not, but that's something we'll get into. But for now, we just want to get some intuition. Okay? And another example, you can see S2 over here, which was declared to be a student class. And student class is declared at the top level here. Are we allowed to really give resident student as a dynamic type? It turns out we can because resident student is actually a subclass. There will be certain uh, parent-child relationship we have to check. But I'll get to the precise rule a little bit later. Okay? But I can tell you all the creations are the same, all the creations. How do you visualize that? I'll just do one just to show you. The way to visualize, let me choose this particular guy over here. Okay, let's say that guy there. Let me make it a little bigger. The way to visualize it is like this. You can see S2. S2 basically is now pointing to a resident student's objects. And remember for resident student's objects, we got name, we got courses, and also we got uh, premium rates, right? I'll say PR over here, right? So this is only specific to uh, resident students. And now to really make sure, so I'm circling that using pink because of dynamic type, okay? From the compiler's point of view, it's only a student's. Okay, student over here, and dynamic type is a resident student. Okay? You can visualize other objects accordingly as well, in a similar way. Now, here is my question. Okay? Pretend you are the compiler. Pretend. Okay? I'm basically saying the following. On this column over here, I'm trying to give you different context objects. For example, S1, S2, S3, and etc. On this particular row over here, I'm suggesting the potential features I may invoke on this particular context object. For example, over here, uh, let me just say that, okay? How, uh, what I should put over here, I'm basically asking, when I write out, let's say just for the uh, orange one, if I write out s1.name, as far as the compiler is concerned, would I be able to write it and get it compiled? That's my question, right? If you believe so, you will put a check mark. If you don't believe so, put a cross mark. That's the exercise. And then you can see so many possible ways we can have, right? You got different possibility for the context objects, which might be declared of different static type and created with different dynamic type. And also so many features you can call. And those features are like the union of all the features from the, the whole inheritance hierarchy, right? So now, how do you fill out the table? in a way that makes sense, basically, right? That's my question. Why don't we try the first row? Okay, let me clear that a little bit. Oh, actually, that's a bit too much. Okay, just that, okay? Let's say just for S1. Let's say for this particular row, right? This row over here. Just this row. Which cells should I put check mark? Which ones? The first four. Okay. Anybody will disagree? The first four. What you are suggesting is let me use different color. Okay. Let me use color. Use green to say use check. Okay. So now you're saying basically I can call s one dot name. I can call s one dot courses. I can call s one dot register. I can also call S1.tuition. Basically, all the features I declare at the student level, which is the static type for S1. Right? What about S1.pr? Am I able to call that? The answer is no. Even though, okay, I'll talk about even though in just a moment. Okay? So now, the re, uh, I just cannot say S1.pr, so that'll be negative and also all the others, simply because the static type for S1 is simply just students. You can only call feature that's defined at this level here. All the lower level, you just cannot call, okay? Any question about filling the first row? 
So let's talk about our second row. Second row seems to be a little bit more like a stronger case to make some uh, different result because you can see as I draw over there, S2, even though statically it was declared as a student's, but it's actually dynamically pointing to a resident student's, right? Which got premium rates available for me. So now, uh, let's, I would like to start with the second row like this. Everybody will agree with me, first of all. S2 would be okay. S2 dot name, S2 dot courses, S2 dot register, S2 dot tuition, right? All came from this uh, class over here, right? Should I be able to say S2 dot PR and S2 dot set PR, given that the dynamic type for S2 is actually resident students, which supports PR here? That's my question. Yes. Should I be able to do it, or should I not be able to do it? You, th you think no. Why? Exactly. The functions available to a particular context object solely depends on its static type, regardless of the dynamic type. That poses some limitation for compiler for any language. Compiler is only able to infer based on the static type declarations. However, for dynamic type, they just cannot know. Okay? I will mention something a little bit more in just a moment, okay? Maybe either today or on Wednesday. Okay, it turns out, in this case, even though the dynamic type for, R, uh, for S2 is actually RS, doesn't matter. All you pay attention to is its static type, which is students over here. So that means it would be the same. And it would be the same also for S3, okay? Let me just, um, Get it a little bit more clear, otherwise you might get confused. Okay. Also, similarly for S2 and S3. And for S3, also you can see the static type for S3 is also students. So you can only call features available at the student level. Right. Good. Let's finish the table. What about RS in this case? You can see here, RS is declared to be of type resident students. So now you can see the static type seems to be more specialized, like a lower in the inheritance hierarchy. So now I should definitely be able to call more features, right? Now, okay, you can think about RS, the static type resident student, which is here. You should be able to call all the features that de that's declared at this level here, plus everything else you inherited from your parents. You gotta accumulate all the features, right? Okay, so tell me if you got any trouble if I try to draw like this. Every feature from the student class, I would be able to call them for sure. Okay, plus every new feature I declare in the resident student class, which is premium rates and set premium rates, right? So that's also fine. However, features from my sibling, I know nothing about. So in that case, I cannot do it. Okay. Any questions until now? It's a very important mental exercise you, you ought to have. Because for your problem later, not necessarily this course, you are always given some inheritance hierarchy or multiple inheritance hierarchy. To what extent you can invoke a particular, uh, you can invoke features on a particular context object. That's something you should know, okay? So you can make some design decisions accordingly. Okay, let me finish that, and then, if you no question, I can move on. Uh, to really finish this, you can see, for NRS, you can see that now the static type is non-resident students. In which case, all the features in the student class, okay, and also new features that's in the non-resident student, discount rate, set discount rate, they're also fine. And then, uh, what I cannot do is the feature that's in my sibling, right? When you switch the static type. Any questions for now? Yes. So your question was, how does, would this be handled differently in the case of Java? The answer is no. It will be handled exactly the same way. Whatever I'm, whatever I'm trying to review right now will actually apply to every object-oriented programming language you will, you will try. It's just that the syntax will be different, right? For example, in Java, let me just say very quickly, right? 
But of course, at this point, the, re the language shouldn't really matter, right? You just, uh, just want to talk about object orientation. Let's just talk about S1. You can see S1 over here was declared to be students, and also you're trying to create dynamically students, right? Okay, in that case, oh, let me just use maybe S2. S2, statically students. S2, dynamically resident students. What you will get in Java already here is students, which correspond to static type over here, and then you say S2. You can see just the syntax is different. And rather than create, I'm going to say new, and then here is going to be dynamic type resident students. New, resident students, and also something over here. And everything else still apply. If you try to fill in a table, let's say for the Java program, it would just be the same table, nothing different. Okay, so that's about this table here. Please keep that in mind. That will be a very important exercise for you. If you got trouble with filling the table, speak to me, okay? All right, what I'd like to move on is, uh, I want to give you a little bit more intuition about polymorphism and dynamic binding before I go a little bit faster to review other stuff, okay? Polymorphism first. I'm pretty sure every one of you know about the answer, okay? Okay, how about, let me double check. Maybe my assumption was wrong. Maybe, that's okay, right? We're gonna wanna review that. Let's talk about this, right? Every time you wanna speak about whether things compile or not, you want to know what, what is the inheritance hierarchy you are talking about. And it is this one here. Students, resident student, non-resident student, okay? We have that over here. Let's say this is what I have. I declare S to be of this type, R S to be of this type, okay? So these two, let me just uh, use laser. S and RS, right? Static type already C. Let's say we try to create them, I will simply say dynamic type for S, simply the same as students. Dynamic type for RS, the same as resident student. That's why I can omit there are curly brackets, right? That's why. And then I simply say seven over here, RS, which is resident student, I'll simply set a premium rate to be 1.25. Let me just draw what I have got so far, and then we'll discuss. From this line here, S is now pointing to a students. And then the name would just be Stella. And uh, also, I might have courses as well, but there's no premium rate, there's no discount rate, right, for students. On the other hand, I have another line over here, which would be RS. It's resident student, dynamically also a resident student. I would say RS over here is pointing to a resident students objects. Of course, also got R, Rachel, let's say. Rachel, and then also Mike got courses, but now, in addition, you also got for resident students, premium rates. Okay, I'll say here, and that, let me highlight it. Which means that's something that's additional to the standard students. So now, I'm, I've traced up to and including line number six. Oh, actually, up to line number seven. For line number seven, what I will do is, it's gonna be 1.25, I'll just put it here. All that's left, eight and nine, okay? So, the following question is gonna be more like a 2030 check question, right? Given that you all passed that course, hopefully with a very high grade, I hope. So now, let's see this. Line number eight and line number nine, which one should compile? Eight, nine, both, neither. I got four choices for you. Jordan? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you know. Just give me one moment. Let me see if anybody wants to try. Okay, Justin, I would I love to point to you, but let's just see. Right, so it's a very fundamental question here. I don't mind if you get, get it wrong. Anybody? Why don't you try? Yes. Okay, you're saying the first one compiles, but the second one doesn't. You're basically saying, line number eight is actually okay, line number nine is not okay. When I say okay or not, compiles or not, right? Guys, is that correct? Who thinks that's not correct? Don't be shy, that's okay, right? Okay? For those of you who think that's incorrect, you're actually wrong. 
Let me tell you what the issue might be, I'm guessing. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe back in your 2030, either you took it with me or not, the way you did it was maybe by memorizing the rules of the substitution to say maybe on the right-hand side, you can put anything that's a subclass of the left-hand side. Maybe that's how you memorize. But your memory might leak sometimes, you know, after maybe one year or two years. So that's another way to go. So what I, the reason I want to talk about this again is to give you some reasoning why. Line number eight should compile, but line number nine shouldn't compile. Can anybody tell me intuitively why line number nine wouldn't compile? Negative. Let me just say a little bit more to it before I answer, okay? Since I said line number nine is a compilation error, so that means there should be some rationale for compiler to, de to decide. If you write code like li li line number nine, you should not even deserve having the code to be executed. But why? Why is that? Aha, uh -huh. that's very good. That's exactly right, okay? So, very good. So the main reasoning is really about, for line number nine, I'll mention that very quickly, verbally, and then I'll write it down. Okay? It's really important for you to know. Right? For line number nine, the reason that it wouldn't compile is if you allowed, hypothetically, this to happen, your program will very likely to crash at the runtime because the expectation on RS is with respect to resident students. And the resident students has one of its expectation, PR, agree? And now, if you do allow this particular assignment to happen, you're basically saying S will now be pointed to by RS, basically, right? Something like that. And now, does this particular object support PR? It doesn't. That's a very quick uh, run through of the logic here. Okay, let me just write it down formally, okay? Uh, for those of you who took uh, 1090, I'm pretty sure every one of you did. You know something about proof by contradiction, right? If I want to prove something that's true, why don't I try to assume that's not true? And then I will lead to some, something that's bad, and then that means on my original assumption, the negation of that should be the case, right? Something like this. So why don't I do, just do this once in detail for you, okay? So for those of you who know about that line number nine shouldn't compile, but didn't know about the reason. So hopefully from now on, you will know, okay? Let's try. The, the way we're going to do it is by proof by contradiction. Okay, how do I do that? Okay, so number one, let's assume line number nine, which is over here, compiled. If it compiled, that means we can execute this particular line at the runtime. What that would do is, it's going to copy over the address that is stored on the right hand side, S, into RS. Effectively, what that would do is, it's going to let RS, rather than pointing to over here, it's now going to point to this object here. Are you okay with it? It's a very fundamental operation you can do in OO for creating alias, right? Okay, let me write it down. Uh, seeing line number one, uh, line number nine compile. Number two, the consequence is RS will points to the students' objects, right? The student object over here. Okay, that's the consequence of that. And now let's go a little bit further. Given that number three. What's the expectation since we have changed the dynamic type of RS? So RS is basically now pointing to this particular object. Let's think about expectation. Expectations on RS. How do we know the expectation? So that goes back to the table we just did, right? RS basically is of type resident students. And for resident students, basically uh, RS over here. Resident student, you can definitely call name, Courses, register, tuition, also whatever that's defined as a new feature in the resident student, including PR and set PR, right? So now let me just write it down. You got name, 
for example, courses, and also you got PR, and also set PR. So these are all valid call by the compiler because they're part of the expectation on the static type for RS. So now, number three is important, but now let's try number four. Okay, that's the last step. If I try number four, if I try to call RS dot PR, this will be allowed by the compiler, right? But what's going to happen if I say rs.pr? Well, rs.pr is going to follow through this pointer here, and then we see this object. Do we have pr? We don't. So crash. All right. You can see by, by allowing line number 9 to compile, we are very likely to crash the program. So that's why the compilation decides it shouldn't be compiled in the first place. I ask any question about this. It's a very fundamental understanding about uh, variable substitution. But I'll mention a little bit more just in a moment. Questions? Is there any way to promote and demote? I would when you say what can be a little bit more precise, what do you mean promote and demote? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why, okay, I see, I see what you mean. If what you really want, okay, first of all, this one wouldn't compile, we know the reason, right? I would say, maybe bear with me a little later. After we have reviewed all the inheritance lecture, you will pretty much know the rationale for why compiler will disallow certain assignments and, would, and some certain assignments will be allowed. Given that, you want to modify your design accordingly, right? So I would say, let me get back to that maybe a little bit later. You will see the answer. For now, it's still a little bit premature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If no questions, I'll go to another thing. Okay, for polymorphism, you will see in the slides, everything's documented. Okay, uh, we'll talk about steady type versus dynamic type. And also, this table here, okay? Also, intuition for polymorphism, okay, you can also review that when you study, okay? But everything has been demonstrated. I want to talk very quickly about dynamic binding, okay? Dynamic binding is something the compiler wouldn't check for you. For you as a programmer, you need to know what you're doing, like what will be the consequence of your program running at the runtime, okay? Then just take a look quickly. And this will exemplify many things we're gonna see later in the design patterns. Quickly, so now you can see we're trying to say we have a course called 3311 over here. Let's say it's 100 bucks, let's say, right? And then we have uh, student S. Statically, S is simply just students. Let's say for the first one, we say it creates RS to be of dynamic type resident students. So that means what we're doing is RS being the resident students is now going to point to this particular object over here, right? That's what we're doing. Let's do a similar execution here. Let me put in orange. And then we got another one uh, that's also, oh, I think I'm missing some context over here. Let me just write it down. So here you got S, also you got RS of type resident students. And RS of type non-resident students, okay, just uh, to be complete, okay? Let's say we also try to create another pro uh, another object, and then we'll talk about how we can change the, the dynamic type. Another one is orange one here. So now let's say NRS, which was declared to be non-resident students. So now that means NRS is now going to point to this particular non-resident students, okay? And then we'll set the premium rates and we set a discount rate, and also we register to the common course for these two students, let's say, right? So what you will see is for the resident students' objects, we got 1.25. For the non-resident students, we got 0 0.75. And their courses list, they actually point to the same course object, right? It's a very quick visualization. Okay? That's how we set it up to begin with. And now we ought to talk about dynamic binding, okay? What I want you to see is this, okay? Let me try to highlight, maybe use pink, uh, maybe, uh, maybe use um, green, maybe. I want you to look at 
Line number seven and line number eight. We are basically trying to call tuition on S. And S statically was declared to be student class. Right? Line number seven is the first time we call S dot tuition. That should give us something. Line number eight, S dot tuition, we're calling that a second time. Context object is the same, S. Feature we're trying to call is also the same, tuition. Now the question is, are we going to get the same number from S dot tuition in line number seven and line number eight? That's my question. Are we or are we not? And this does illustrate the essence for dynamic binding. And you will see lots of uh, scenario like this when we talk about design patterns. That's why it's so important for you to review that, okay? Quest uh, any answer? Uh, Ori. Why? Well, I agree they will be different, but why would, be, would that be? Mm hmm Exactly, that's right. Okay, thank you. So now, what you should pay attention to for this example here, you can see now for line number seven, okay, before we try to call S the tuition, we actually said S is assigned to RS. According to our intuition previously about doing assignments, this will be okay. So that means S right now of static type students is now going to point to resident students. So now we are saying that at this point over here, for S, the static type is students. Dynamic type is resident students. And you're trying to call tuition. How many versions of tuition do we have? That's the question, right? Let's put it here. Remember the hierarchy. We got students over here. We got resident students. We also got non-resident students. And for the student class, we define tuition to calculate the base rate. I'll just say T over here. And in the resident student class, we got T plus plus because we just redefined the tuition using premium rates. And similarly, for NRS, we use T plus plus also for use, uh, the redefined version using discount rate. So we got three versions actually. So let's say one, two, and three. In line number seven, after doing this substitution, like assignments, which version of the tuition am I going to call at runtime? One, two, or three? Two? Everybody agree? Okay, you guys are very shy, but I assume you agree, right? You'll be two, because the version of the feature that will be called at any point when you have inheritance into play depends on the dynamic type of the context objects. In this case, the only way for you to figure out is not by the compiler. You have to figure it out as a programmer by drawing some diagram. In this case, resident students, right? So that will be the resident students. So in that case, you will be 100 applied with 1.25. So what you will get is 125. Okay, that's one number. Let's now get to line number eight, right? For line number eight, uh, I'm gonna use a different color just to distinguish. For line, line number eight, before I try to call this particular tuition here, right? Basically the same method or feature, but maybe different version. So now S is assigned to NRS. This will also be allowed. So now S rather than pointing to over here, is now going to point to wherever NRS is pointing to. So now at this point over here, uh, contrast. S, static type, and also dynamic type. Question. At this point, in line number eight, after that assignment, what would be the static type for S? Students? Sure, student, because static type never changes. You only change dynamic type. So now what we will get is static type will just be student, remain to be. Okay, student st static type always remain the same, but now the dynamic type will be resident students. Oh, sorry, non-resident students, like pardon? Not resident student over here. And now, if you call S dot tuition, which version are we gonna call? One, two, or three? Three, okay? Three here, because it's non-resident students. Now, if you do that, 100 times uh, 0 0.75, 
That's why you get 75. It's, it's, a very, it's a simple example here, but it really illustrates to you, even though you're calling the same feature on the same uh, context objects, the consequence could be different because dynamic time might change. So that's something, that's why programming inheritance is a little bit tricky when you actually got issues like this. Okay? Later on, when we talk about some more complicated design patterns, for example, visitor pattern, we're going to see that later. That's something you have to uh, know very well in order to understand the design pattern. Okay. Okay. So after this, what I would like to do is to do some quick uh, case study. Given that we know about polymorphism, we know about diamond binding. So far, the inheritance hierarchy we are speaking about is pretty easy. I simply just got one parent class, uh, just only one level, two levels. You can think about at the top level is only the parent class, and the two child classes. Let's live with that just for now. And on Wednesday, I'm going to generalize it into a tree. What you will have to see on Wednesday to make everything general. In general, your inheritance hierarchy should look like a tree. And we should really know something about it abstractly. And that will really solve all the conceptual difficulties for any design pattern you have to learn. Okay, We'll get there possibly on Wednesday. I'll do that quickly, just using one lecture. Question first. Ah, good question. Uh, it's basically like asking what about the object class in Java, right? The same. Okay. Uh, good question. I'll just mention that quickly before I talk about the case study. Okay, it's relevant. The question was like this. Remember, we got resident students, and also you got two child classes. Resid oh, sorry, students. That's what I meant. Let's say I have students over here, resident students non-resident students, okay? What about any class? You can think about implicitly, every class is a subclass of the any class, any class. But typically, you wouldn't really want to really in, in, uh, to include any in your design. That would mean it's a very poor design, okay? So if you really want to draw the diagram, you might draw like student is, uh, that's, uh, student is also a, subclass of any. So that means implicitly RS is a subclass of any. And RS is also a subclass of any. That's how you can understand it. Okay? Make sense to you? But is it done by default? It's done by default, yes. No, you don't have to. So it's like for any uh, OOP. We are saying there would be a single class that's a common ancestor for every class. It's something that exists over there, but you don't have to explicitly say, uh, for example, student extends any, you don't have to. It's like in Java, you don't have to say uh, student extends uh, objects, you don't have to. You're just there. Okay. So now let's do a very quick case study. Okay. Now that we understand about polymorphism and dynamic binding, right? So about these two concepts. A problem that we hope to solve before the reading week or since the beginning of the course is to see how we can test post condition, right? Remember what I told you before, okay? Before we see this design here, let's say testing of post condition. What I told you before, uh, before, which is a very poor design, goes like this. Let's say I have a class, just call it A, for example. For A, I have a feature. Uh, let's say it uh, doesn't have any parameter. Just make it more uh, like a simpler. And also, I have some implementation over here. It does something exactly correct. And then I would say ensure. And then let me make the room a little bit more. And the post condition I would like to test. Let's say post condition number one. And then I'll say alpha. Okay, just some Boolean expression. Okay. Now, how do we test alpha? Of course, in general, you may have different post conditions. It can be alpha, beta, et cetera, right? You can have as many post conditions as you like, organizing a sequential manner. What I said to you before, temporarily, try to add some code over here such that you introduce some error. And then run the workbench system and make sure you trigger exactly the violation of alpha. 
Once you have seen that, you're convinced, you will simply comment this out to make sure it doesn't stay in your code. Right? That's always said before. If you got different kinds of post condition, you may have to introduce different kinds of error to trigger exactly that kind of post condition. Right? That's what you said. This is good, but what if you forget? If you forget, if you forget to put back the uh, error, the the, uh, the wrong line you actually introduce, then you'll be in trouble, right? Because your code it will simply not be correct. And this process over here is also very manual. It's not good. You want to say every time if you want to test my post condition, I don't want to say I want to uncomment the errors and put it back later. That's not a way to go. So there is a way to do it. And I wonder if I just by sketching this, can you see any connection to inheritance? I wonder. Let me give you just a little bit more hints. Imagine that this is one version of the code that's correct. Orange one is something additional I want to introduce to violate certain post condition. And I somehow don't want to comment out the orange one when I don't need it. I just want to put it aside somewhere. So now, do you see any hints about how you can use inheritance for this? Ring. Exactly. That's exactly right. What you have to do is like this. I'll sketch that a little bit, and then I'll show you the example. Well, ring set was exactly correct. Basically, what you have to do is like this. You basically have still keep class A over here, and then keep this over here in A. And then what you will do is for this particular additional one, you're going to move it out into a subclass called B. And B is going to inherit from A. And then just for now, know that every post condition and precondition D will be inherited to the subclass. So you're still checking the same post condition. Just know that. We're going to see a little bit more theory into it. Once you have done this, you got class A, you got class B. You can think about a B is more like a like a very evil child or evil descendants. Okay? You just want to make sure dynamically, you, when you want to test for the post condition, you will call the version of the F in class B. So that will trigger the post condition violation. Okay, that's kind of roughly the idea. Ori. So just to clarify, you don't have to reiterate each child, right? You don't have to, yeah, exactly. So what you're saying is, do I need to redeclare post condition one, post condition two in B? You don't have to. Right, you don't have to. They will be inherited. Okay, let's take a look at the design. Okay? I had a very uh, simple example for you. Also, I made the source code available to you as well. You can uh, take a look. Okay. Uh, let's use the example we did uh, in the beginning about account. That would be the easier one to illustrate. Okay, let's take a look. Let's say I have a class called account. And then let's say I got a, a, com a command called withdraw, some amount. And then let's say let's not worry about pre, wor, let's not worry about the precondition for now. Let's say just uh, some conceivable uh, precondition. The correct implementation I have is balance is assigned to balance minus the amount, right? And then the post condition I would like to test is I want to make sure balance is really decremented. Okay, that's a post condition I want to test. Let me make some annotation over here. So this line over here is basically the correct implementation. And this line over here is the post condition I want to test. And now, we, what we want to do is to create a descendant class, like a child class, and then we're going to redefine the withdraw method to introduce the error. So that if dynamically I caught an instance of type bad account withdraw, it's going to trigger that post condition accordingly. Okay, let's see. So what I will do now is, first of all, you can see I'm using precursor, right? Precursor over here is calling exactly this version over here, right? The version that's from the parent class. And then I'm introducing something that's bad. I'll put it in blue. So this, I'm gonna make an annotation over here. So this guy here is basically some uh, to make the implementation wrong. Okay? Of course, you, you don't necessarily have to put only a single line. You may put multiple lines to make your implementation wrong to trigger exactly the post condition you want to fail. Okay? Let's take a look at the client side. 
you can see what the two classes I talk about, these are the supplier. Right? You can think about, you, start, you started with this account class, and then in order to test for this particular post condition, you create this particular bad descendants accordingly. Okay? And now, how do I write a test for the post condition? What I will do is, I'm going to create another class, let's say for the te ES test. So that's something you know how to write. And now, the way to do it is, uh, notice one thing, notice one thing. You can see, uh, for every post condition, we had a tag, right? This tag is going to be used to identify which post condition actually got triggered. That's why it's quite important, okay? Let's take a look. In this particular test class, I have a command, and notice that this test feature does not return Boolean anymore. You're basically calling a command, okay? That's something that's new to you. And then I simply say ACC dynamically, well, statically I said it should be bad account withdraw. And dynamically, it will just be the same. That's why I don't have that curly bracket thing, right? It's just ignored, okay? So now, bad account withdraw is referring to this particular class with the extra line that I, that I need to, uh, to trigger that post condition violation. Okay, and then now, if I try to call this line over here to say ACC that withdraw 50. At a runtime, what's going to happen? Right? That's important to know. Two issues over here. Right? Number one. If I uh, let me just move this line here. Okay. Question number one: Does it compile? Number two: If it compiles, which version? of withdraw is actually called, right? Two questions for you, right? We need to answer each one of them. How about question one? Should it compile if I write acc.withdraw in that particular context? Should it compile? Yes? Okay, why? Exactly, okay. So now, basically, uh, number one is gonna compile because ACC was declared to be of this particular static type, which is over here. And that one there is guaranteed to re-inherit the feature from its parent, which is withdraw. So it's guaranteed withdraw is fine. It's part of the expectation, okay? And now, which version is it going to call? Let's say the withdraw here is called version one. The withdraw over here is called version two. Is it going to call version one or version two? Version two? Because the dynamic type for ACC over there is bad account, exactly. Okay, that's a very easy case study for something useful by using polymorphism and dynamic binding, okay? The version of withdrawal in bad account withdrawal, right? I'll say bad account withdrawal is call. And by invoking this one here, that means we're gonna do whatever that's actually correct in the precursor, right? And then we're gonna do whatever that's wrong and which will trigger the post condition that's inherited to this particular class. And then we're gonna get that one exactly, okay? What's really important is uh, the way you actually add this test to your tester. Let me just say one more thing, okay? Remember every time you have to, what you will do is you're gonna say, at, uh, do I have it over here? Oh, over here, sorry. So now when you do, so this is the test we just talked about, okay? Just over here. And now to really do it, you say add violation case with tag. And this string over here is the first argument. So that's the tag that corresponds to the post condition you want to test, okay? Something very quickly. And as an exercise for you, okay? I want you to go back to the lecture for complete post condition. Over there, we actually got the deposit on version five, the final version that's actually correct. Is it possible for you to actually create a new descendant class that's going to trigger some post condition violation? So that's the exercise for you, okay? So now, two things to learn from this particular case study. Number one, just by looking at this particular uh, architecture diagram, you should be able to imagine how the, dis how the implementation is gonna occur. That's some technique you wanna pick up. You don't necessarily have to see the code every time to understand what's going on. 
just by the design diagram, if that's properly presented, it should be able to infer. And number two, you want to practice this maybe, because later on you can also test for violation for your post condition. Let's say for the makeup lab test uh, one, if you want to take it this Friday, feel free to apply this, but let me warn you, okay? If you do want to create extra classes to test your post condition this Friday, by all means, do it. That's good for you. However, before you submit, make sure delete all the extra classes you created because the grading script is not gonna expect you to create any new classes, okay? But you should really practice the pattern here. Okay, I'll continue from here on Wednesday.